Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third seminar of this uh, Digital Culture Heritage um, Sinoikis uh, series. Um, our topic today is the decolonization of cultural heritage, and uh, we will be looking in particular uh, with our case studies um, of how uh, digital technologies have an impact on uh, this process for you know how they can uh, maybe facilitate it how they can you know maybe sometimes just replicate the same barriers that um, we have seen in traditional scholarship or in the um, history of uh, museum uh, museum studies uh, fine arts and cultural heritage um, so today uh, our speakers are um, uh, Gabi, uh, that uh, you know, is my co convener We also have uh, Usama Gat, uh, we have uh, Zina Kamash, and we have uh, Patricia Murrieta Flores. Um, and Zina will uh, start uh, introducing uh, with a general introduction to um, the decolonization of cultural heritage. You have to, okay. You're on mute okay. now. I'm yeah. muted now. <laughs> right. Sorry, I have a wheel of death currently on my screen. Right. Okay. <laughs> here, I think. Let's see if I can get my slides up. Oop. It's on there. Okay. I now have a black screen. I'm not quite sure what's uh, happening there. It's, that's your screen, isn't it? Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. I'm having a few technical issues, but we're getting there. <laughs> right. Okay, hopefully my slides will appear shortly. I'll just start talking anyway while I... Okay, yes, we can see the slides. Uh... Um, so, uh, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Zina Kamash. Uh, and uh, I appear to have just lost my slides off my screen. Um, and I'm going to start by talking to you about uh, digital cultural heritage. Um, and uh, the plan is once I have my slides back, what's on my video? Um, so I'm going to start just by um, uh, sketching out briefly what it means to decolonize uh, and why we need it. Then I'm going to talk about some of um, two aspects of my research. I'm going to start with um, some of the work I've done on uh, decolonizing uh, Roman archaeology um, and then move into um, uh, some of the work that I do around post-conflict reconstruction. Um, so the first thing to kind of really emphasize right from the start is that anything around decolonizing um, is has to be treated really carefully. It's a really hefty, really difficult term. And it's beginning to be slightly bandied about uh, by people um, and uh, not, not used maybe as carefully as it should. Um, so uh, we need to be really aware that what we're talking about has uh, a difficult history um, and uh, that we're talking about a political process. Um, and those two parts of that are important, that this is political um, and it's a process that might never come to an end. Um, and... Uh, it's something that we are striving towards, or certainly something that I feel I'm striving towards, a form of equality. Um, in the academic sphere, uh, what we're looking at really is uh, a whole network of different issues that all um, come together. Uh, and when people talk about decolonizing, particularly uh, in academic circles, uh, it tends to be 
um, uh, a focus on the curriculum. That's what we hear about the most, decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, but that's really only one tiny facet of, of what decolonizing even just academia uh, involves. There's a whole host of different moving parts. And if we only fix one little bit of it, uh, we'll never quite fix the whole. Um, so, um, uh, so we need to take kind of action across lots of different levels. And I'm going to try and um, draw out um, some of those uh, different facets. Uh, I'm still struggling to get my slides to show. I, yeah, I saw some uh, some forced hard so PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, no, no. That's okay, we did slides one and two, I think, without slides. <laughs> right, here we go. Okay, so we've done that bit. Uh, right, that was a little summary of what I was going to talk about. So what is decolonizing is the bit I've just talked about. So this idea that um, we're only going to talk about it probably in parts today, but we need to remember that what we're looking at is a very complex whole. So the problem, uh, particularly for our area around cultural heritage, archaeology, um, has been very nicely kind of mapped out for us by the Royal Historical Society's report on race, ethnicity and equality, uh, which um, is a must read uh, report. You can download it for free. Uh, and they look at a particular kind of um, unit called historical and philosophical studies and that's relevant to us because within that is where archaeology departments also come. So you can see some of the stats here. So uh, undergraduate and postgraduate level BAME, so uh, that's black, Asian and minority ethnic um, students make up 11.3 and 8.6 percent of the population. And I should just say here that there's lots of different ways of referring to uh, a BAME population. Some people prefer to be called people of colour. Um, I'm using the, the language that the Royal Historical Society have used. Um, so in comparison to the rest of the uh, BAME population in universities, historical and philosophical studies are, are running at quite a low um uh, percentage and we need to do quite a lot better. We're also running below the baseline for the UK population where the overall BAME population is about 15% uh, but rising uh, so 15% is the bare minimum you want to be aiming for um, uh, and that's why we see a slightly higher number across um, the whole population in universities and there are some subjects um, that attract more BAME students than others. And again, this is part of this wider problem that we need to look at. One of the particularly big problems um, for uh, historical and philosophical studies is not just the students, but it's also uh, academic staff, which is overwhelmingly white. So it's um, just shy of 94%. Uh, so there's really a lot of work to be done to kind of really change what's happening in our universities. Um, so in terms of thinking about Roman archaeology, this is um, a piece of work that I did um, uh, for a, a keynote lecture uh, that will be published. And I'm just going to talk about one very small bit of it, but it will give you a, a flavour of some of what's going on uh, in our discipline. Um, so this is one lens that I've taken to look at this issue, and it looks at theoretical Roman archaeology conferences and Roman archaeology conferences. That's what track and rack means. And I've looked at all the programmes, or nearly all the programmes that I could get my hands on, from 1991 to 2019. And the data aren't perfect. Uh, I'm happy to discuss um, uh, later on or separately um, how I've kind of got these data, uh, but they're derived from the programme. So the programmes obviously weren't um, designed to do this sort of work on. But from the people I can identify uh, as BAME from the programmes, we're looking at very, very low percentages and really percentages that reflect um, what the Royal Historical Society um, numbers are also showing us. Um, so probably the most reliable one that I have is 2019, um, where uh, the highest percentage ever at a track conference, which was 10.9%, so still well below the 15% um, population average. Uh, but that was actually only three people. Um, so we're talking tiny numbers here. Uh, there's also quite a long time lag. Um, so first session to be organised by a BAME woman uh, wasn't until 2010. Uh, it was me. Um, uh, and the first 
uh, BAME person to give the plenary or the keynote lecture uh, was in 2019. And that was also me. So I also need to diversify from me. Um, uh, and uh, and find uh, there are other people out there that we can uh, get involved. Um, so another way of looking at the same data, um, possibly a slightly more um, robust um, method into it, is by looking at where people are based as well and trying to unpick what's happening here. So the graph that you can see in front of you shows that nearly 50% of um, session organisers and paper presenters are based in the UK. Uh, and when we add that together with Western Europe and do all of Western Europe, so mainland plus the UK, uh, we're looking at nearly 70%. Now, the obvious way to interpret this is that this is due to proximity. So almost all the conferences for Rack and Track uh, have been held in the UK. Uh, there have been three in Western Europe and one in the US. It will in 2020 go to Eastern Europe, uh, and that's the fir first and furthest place it's ever gone uh, outside of, um, uh, of the West. Um, so also some work to do on conference location. Um, so that proximity looks like it plays a part, certainly Australasia, that seems to explain that under 1%. But uh, if we start unpicking those data, uh, we get some other patterns coming up. So Eastern Europe, uh, session organisers only 1%, uh, from Middle East and North Africa, from MENA, 1.3%. Uh, um, yet from North America, 7.7%. So there's something going on here. And there's something going on that probably to some extent goes beyond uh, or is slightly different to decolonising as well in that there's this issue with Eastern Europe as well. My interpretation of these numbers is that what we're looking at here is the effect of conflict, uh, the effect of uh, the wealth of various countries. So both Eastern Europe and uh, the Middle East and North Africa have what are known as DAC countries, development assistance countries, and also issues around freedom of movement. And this is what I wanted to draw out about how all of these things are interconnected. So if we drill down a little bit into the MENA data and look at individual countries, uh, we can see that five out of eight session organisers and 29 out of 61 paper presenters all came from one country, from Israel. Uh, and that's noteworthy because Israel is the only MENA country that is not a DAC country, so it's wealthy, and it also has very different visa rules um, for entering the UK. So if you're an Israeli person entering the UK, you can do so fairly easily. You do not have to go through the pretty torturous process of trying to get a visa in advance uh, that people from other men and countries have to go to. So this is why we need to look beyond just what we're doing in the academy. There's lots of other kind of pressing factors uh, that dictate what we do and structural issues that need tackling. Um, and this isn't just a problem for track and rack conferences. Uh, Usama, who you'll hear from in just a moment, and his colleagues Catherine and Rachel have also done um, some really interesting work on um, paparology conferences and the committee of paparologists that show very similar um, sets of problems going on and um, dominances that don't reflect uh, what we might want them to reflect. So thinking then about how this fits with cultural heritage, um, obviously, we can't detach ourselves from our um, disciplines. So what we do in cultural heritage also reflects some of these patterns. One of the things that I was told quite a lot in a different part of the decolonising Roman archaeology project, I also did a survey uh, around teaching, uh, and several responses um, uh, got slightly irate and said, but archaeology is not political. You shouldn't be political about these things. We should just be objective. So I think it's really important to take that on um, kind of head on uh, and tackle it um, because it's it's still a, uh, an opinion that is out there. Um, but it really is a myth. This idea that we can be apolitical and objective in any work we do is simply, to my mind, not true. And we all come with biases and sometimes those can be quite positive biases and can give us insights uh, that we might not otherwise have. Uh, but they can also be really quite negative. Um, and in disciplinary perspective, those biases are inherent right from the start. So 
um, we need to acknowledge that past where our discipline has come from. We need to think about how that impacts on what we do in the present. And then we need to try and find ways to change it. So I'm just going to go back into the 18th century very briefly and then move us into the present uh, and show how in one particular case um, we can see these impacts happening. So we're going to start with um, uh, a man called Robert Wood, um, also known as Robert Palmyra Wood. Um, and he uh, travelled to Palmyra in uh, the mid-18th century uh, and wrote uh, what is now a very famous book called The Ruins of Palmyra. Um, but if you go back and read that book with a kind of decolonizing hat on, you can see all sorts of um, uh, patterns and trends kind of being set up here. Um, and in particular, he takes a very Eurocentric view and he begins a process of claiming this site uh, for the West. Um, and we'll see how that plays out in just a moment. And he does that in kind of various ways. Um, so in particular, he writes out Arab historians um, and he denigrates anybody who he meets um, who is not one of his uh, European travellers who is travelling with him. So, for example, on uh, page two, so right at the beginning, page two of this book, he dismisses all Arab historians as fable and wild conjecture. And they don't get talked about again, uh, apart from one uh, writer who gets mentioned by name, Abul Fader. Uh, and this is not particularly complimentary about him. Uh, he says he's the only one worth quoting. And he was very probably ignorant of its Greek name and history and only calls the site Tedmor. What he doesn't consider at all here is that perhaps Abul Fader uses the name Tedmor for very specific reasons, and that maybe he's deliberately not using the Greek name because he wants to emphasise um, its Arab past. Um, uh, so embedded right at the beginning of the narrative of this place is a kind of twisting it round so that it loses its Arabness, as it were, uh, its localness, uh, and uh, gets um, appropriated by the West. So you might be asking yourselves why any of that is important. Well, it's important because of what is happening to that uh, place now, to Tadmod Palmyra in the present. So these are some of the uh, media headlines around um, uh, digital reconstructions um, for parts of the archaeological sites um, that were damaged by Daesh uh, in recent conflict. So we get things like comes to life. That's not too bad, but it's a bit dodgy. Uh, we get things like helping us save our history. Yeah, that's all getting slightly into white saviour territory. Um, uh, returning digitally, um, fake it till you remake it. This is all a bit odd. Uh, the most disturbing ones for me are around the idea of resurrection. That's an extremely loaded term and it's an extremely religious term. Is this really the way we want to be talking about things. Um, and also, while most of those media headlines that I showed you related to one particular company, the um, uh, Institute for Digital Archaeology, uh, this is also slipping into academic discourse as well. So there's this recent book, uh, Reviving Palmyra in Multiple Dimensions. You can see it has reviving in the title. Um, it makes very grand claims for how what they're doing will save cultural memory, will save the people of Palmyra. Yet there's no real justification for how any of that is actually going to happen. And there's very little um, uh, voice of actual um, Syrian people um, or what they want in any of this. Uh, and this is therefore um, uh, what we might call a form of digital colonialism, a way of appropriating this site again uh, by the West and for the West. And we can see this in a different way as well. So. Um, if we look at just the number of uh, reconstruction projects that various sites across the Middle East have attracted, uh, we can see that each time Tadmor Palmyra comes up top, so Aleppo and Mosul um, are significantly lower in terms of total projects, but also in terms of media articles, so we just don't talk about those places as much in the West, um, and yet they have suffered just as much as, um, as the site of and um, city of Tadmor Palmyra has. And this 
kind of twisting of Tudmor Palmyra comes out really clearly, I think, in this quote from uh, an article in Nature, um, where it's d discussed as a purely archaeological site, not embedded in a modern city. And she goes on to make the comparison with Aleppo, with Morsel, and saying that these are embedded in modern cities. But this is just simply not true. There is a modern um, town in Tadmor Palmyra, and those inhabitants, the people who live there, have suffered just as much, if not possibly more so, uh, than the archaeological site has. And we've just written them out. So they've continued to be written out over and over and over again from wood onwards. And it's this... Um, kind of writing out that we need to redress um, through um, thinking about decolonising cultural heritage and, and noticing where it's happening. Um, so that brings me pretty much to the end of what I want to say. I just want to end with a Syrian voice, um, uh, which was written in a, a different project I wrote, um, who has a very simple message that they wanted uh, to be heard. Um, so I will pass over to Usama now. Thank you very much for listening. So, um, thank you, Zena, for this introduction. Uh, this was wonderful, actually. And it also um, helped. I'm going to... Uh, well, there you are. Now you... Uh, yes, I just wanted, before Usama starts talking, I just wanted to invite the people that are watching this live, in particular the students, if they want to, you know, uh, ping and say uh, hello. And if they want to ask questions, they can use um, the, the comments on YouTube anytime. We will take questions and we will ask our speakers uh, to, to answer that. So sorry about interrupting you, uh, Usama. Now the floor is all for you and please uh, go on. Um, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Now, um, I, I thought that I, I should be getting into the to work directly. So, um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you, Gabby, for having me uh, for this. And, and thank you, Zena, for uh, this wonderful introduction. So I will not take uh, too much. Um, my uh, slideshow will be um, uh, as short as I could. Uh, and I will connect with... Uh, uh, all what Zena has said about this important topic, uh, but from uh, you know uh, the perspective of someone who comes from uh, the global south. Um, I hope that uh, I am now. Uh, do you do you see my slides now? Or I lost contact with you. Because I'm not hearing anyone of you. I can hear you. Great, wonderful. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone hears me. Uh, now I'm trying to um, open my uh, PowerPoint and um, Yes, actually, we need a lot of work in this direction, and um, there is a lot um, to, to do. Okay. Yeah. We don't see your yes. PowerPoint yet, uh, Usama, but uh, keep talking. I'll be I'll be on you. Okay, so um, um, um it is you know loading uh, supposedly. Yeah. So if you listen to me, I will just wait and the will... Sure try to fill in the space between, so hopefully it will come out. Um, so I think there is a lot of work to do here, uh, both theoretically and practically, as uh, uh, Zena said. What I will be uh, presenting uh, now is just uh, some of the, uh, the theoretical work I am trying to uh, uh, navigate uh, decolonization through and also uh, um, um, I hope this will come up um, and also some of the uh, practical uh, solution that I am trying with all uh, of the participants uh, of this session with Gabby, uh, with Zena and hopefully also uh, with Betty. Um, 
the idea of decolonizing to me um, is very important because I'm teaching in Cairo uh, uh, in uh, in Shams University, and I'm teaching one of the most important um, um, patrimony of Egypt, which is uh, uh, papyri, and um, it's not coming out. In uh, we can see your slides so, now. If you if you just go full screen, that should um, that should do. Okay, wonderful. So uh, I will just close this, and we'll try to. Now you, you full screen. Now uh, I hope this one will be as low as uh, it is. Uh, so my my idea about decolonizing comes comes from uh, the idea of an archive, and I am trying to uh, talk about first about the. Uh, the archive, uh, and then uh, it's a little bit slow. So, uh, so I hope this will work. Yes. Okay. So now, a uh, troubled archive first. The Egyptian papyri, and I will talk about civilization and culture and what is. What, what do I mean by print and digital culture? And I will uh, talk about what is global knowledge and globalization. And then I will move into uh, the idea of power, contestation over space, time, and objects. And uh, in all this, you will have something to do with content and data and uh, metadata. So uh, I will start first with, with this you know, uh, lovely thing about um, Nefertiti. Uh, and as you can see, um, this is Sausan Badr, uh, who is an Egyptian, a famous Egyptian um, actress. And uh, the resemblance to Nefertiti is something which is, you know, remarkable, I have to say. And she has been posted, this is from her Instagram, by the way. So um, even if this Nefertiti is not in Egypt, you know, uh, this does not prevent people from identifying themselves with it, you know, um, regardless of the legal, the legal and, you know, whatever the scientific or um, archaeological discussion or dispute about it. But again, the people are using digital media to identify with this heritage. And also uh, these pictures, uh, which is um, from Al Musawar's magazine, and it was as you can see from the Arabic uh, date, it's 1948. So as early as 1948, and the Egyptians are identifying themselves with Nefertiti. And actually, I did not find this in any archives. But when I came here in the British Museum, the British Museum, and I wanted to see the Rosetta Stones for the first time of my life. And this is another story that has to do with the visa, uh, you know, torturing as uh, Zena. Uh, talked about, but uh, in order not to get off the topic, uh, this is in the British Museum, and uh, uh, it's actually a great project, I mean the modern Egyptian project, but it is quite marginalized by its space, and the Rosetta Stone is there, you know, everyone is rushing into the Rosetta Stone, this is my picture, and as you can see in in the background, you have this modern Egyptian and Nefertiti and all these things, which you know relates the story of the Egyptians with their heritage. You know, radio and you know sewing machine and you know typewriter and everything. You know, and and so or magazine over there, and the uh, Rosetta Stone, of course, which is in the focus of everything. This is because the print and digital culture until now is focusing on ancient Egypt because. The, 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 the impeding idea that Zena has talked about, you know, the Rosetta Stone is impeded in an ancient place which does not exist in Egypt now, you know. <laughs> but actually, this is not this is not the case. So um, uh, much of 
much of the, the discussion and disputes uh, about archaeology, you know, has come from this important book. Uh, I have read a review, a recent review of it, uh, which has uh, has this sentence, you know, archaeology or Egyptology before Donald Malcolm Reed's Contesting Antiquity in Egypt is not like Egyptology after Donald Malcolm Reed's, you know, book. He has two volumes about this, and again, Nefertiti is there. Uh, and this will connect us with the idea that Zena has talked about, I mean, the, the political milieu. Of course, that everything is something like, at least to me, uh, has to do with politics and modern policy, politics and modernity. So this is again from Donald Malcolm Reed's book. Uh, and the note, uh, the footnote 84 reads, although the 1919 Uprising, I mean, this is a revolution in Egypt, you know, uprising did not win full independence from the British uh, uh, occupation or overturn the socio political order in Egypt. Egyptians call it a revolution, Thawra. Similarly, the European risings of 1848 are called revolutions, even though they largely fail. So, so this is this is again. Uh, what has been uh, said about the Arab Spring, you know, it's not spring. Actually, the spring, the name itself is Eurocentric because it comes from the spring of the nations, 1848. But it's a very good, uh, you know, approach to uh, to understand what is happening in this region. Um, and again, to come to the classics, once again, this is Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities, and I find this very uh, important to uh, to read here uh, about how the classics have been bent, the print culture. By the middle of the 18th century, the prodigious laborers of German, French, and English scholars had not only made available, I hope this is clear, in handy printed form virtually the entire extant corpus of the Greek classics, along with the necessary philological and lexicographical adjuncts but in dozens of books were recreating a glittering and firmly pagan ancient Hellenic civilization. In the last quarters of the century, this past became increasingly accessible to a small number of young Greek-speaking Christian intellectuals, most of whom had studied uh, and traveled outside the conf uh, confines of the Ottoman Empire. Exalted by the Philhellenism, at the centers of Western European civilization, they undertook the debarbarizing of the modern Greeks, i.e., their transformation into beings worthy of Berkeley's and Socrates. So I think this this is very important to put everything is in perspective. Uh, and another one. So this is how to. Uh, take Greece into account. It's the European cause of democracy, and Greece is the place where democracy has been born, but actually it's more complicated than this. Uh, what about the Middle East? What about Egypt? Egypt is always, as we say in German, Sonderstellungs Ägypten, which is exceptional, in an exceptional place. And uh, in the fourth edition of a political economy of the Middle East, I have read this very important, um, you know, um, uh, statement about uh, given that you know most countries of the world that had become democratic after the third wave of the democratization in the 1980s and 1990s, this has led to a belief that the Middle East is exceptional in this dimension. I mean, democracy, or the author means a democracy, and much ink has been spelled by authors trying to identify the sources of the region's exceptionalism, whether in its culture, factor endowment, social structures, or history. So here is a search for it. Here is a search for the culture in the Middle East, and actually a search for exceptionalism, you know, which is not actually the case. If you look at the third wave of democratization, it's 1980s and 1990s, so it's, it's a recent phenomenon. But again, it's just search for reconstructions. 
And I will not get into the uh, six concepts of culture here, maybe in the offline session, but very important again to the, the notion of culture or civilization, you know, um, is uh, what Alida Asman has uh, told us about it. Uh, so the European, uh, the uh, sociologist uh, Norbert Elias tells us in two fascinating volumes how difficult it was for Europeans in early modern times to learn forms of etiquette which are taken for granted today in the training of three, five-year-olds. Things like eating with a knife and fork, suppressing body sounds, wiping one's nose, etc. The key expression in such training programs is civilization which means long-term control over the body or mastering nature in man. Despite the centuries of such disciplinary training, however, Elias sees civilization not as a stable achievement, but as a still weak counterbalance to unbridled effects, rather like a thin layer of ice covering hidden and dangerous deep things. This was also Sigmund Freud's view on civilization and its discontents. On the one hand, he placed a great hope in what he called fortress in the Geistisch, uh, Geistischkeit, which is translated into English both as a progress in intellectuality and progress in spirit, uh, spirituality. On the other hand, Freud, who in a period of rising anti-Semitism saved his own life only by immigrating from national socialist Vienna to London also realized that the process of individual cultivation could never be granted and might at any time turn into a reactionary collective unleashing of regressive instincts. So this is very, very illuminating, I, has, I have to say, and now I will turn to the archive. What I mean by a troubled archive, what, how the different people are troubled. Egyptian papyri are the main study objects of the field called Bibliology. The founding father of this discipline are Western scholars who, based in study centers in Europe, the UK, and the USA, were able during the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries to build a massive archive of Egyptian papyri, I mean here in the West, to support their research and teaching with original artifacts. The dispersed collection of these papyri in all in these Western study centers is at least to me as an Egyptian scholar of Greek Roman Egypt, a troubled archive, an archive full of troubles with a complex legacy of imperialism and colonialism. This is actually uh, not the meaning uh, adopted in papyrology about archives. So, but uh, again, I, to me, the whole archive of Egyptian papyri are the archive. And to me, there is a great epistemological dilemma here because papyrology is too, uh, the epistemological dilemma is too clear to be ignored. While the body of knowledge of this discipline was, and to a larger degree still, is produced by Western individuals and an institution of higher education culture, its archive, this troubled archive, is an Egyptian archive of historical documents. And while there have been Western individuals and institutions processing these artifacts, processing this archive, and the producing actually an impressive body of knowledge about it, are struggling to preserve what they see as national heritage that has been nationalized. Their societies are not convinced by their discourse about the past and are extremely critical of the injustices of imperialism, colonialism, nationalism, and the contaminated body of knowledge produced in this and the other antiquity related disciplines. You know, I think I think there is a, a great deal of, you know, debate about this knowledge now, and the debate comes again from the West. Uh, and my ethical and scholarly position in this uh, is clear. There should be a dialogue without proper dialogue and conversation between Egyptian scholars representing Egypt and, of course, every other scholar as Zena told us, you know, where is Assyrian, where, where are the Iraqis, Libyans, you know, schoolers of antiquity. There should be people there who are studying antiquity. Uh, and uh, Western scholar representing Europe and its American offshoot, there is no future for papyrology in the 21st century. All the geopolitical, societal, economical realities in the global north and south, now it's a global phenomenon, push me to believe firmly in this position. So, this argument 
and other arguments has been incorporated in Nicola Ricciani digital papyrology. I think you, it's illuminating to and inf very informative to uh, um, to read this, you know, because this is exactly what I mean. I think Nicola has um, um, read uh, or heard my voice. The endless possibilities of digital communication can have positive, this is Nicola's word, positive outcomes uh, on the spread of papyrological knowledge, not only uh, outside the purely academic world, but also outside traditional geopolitical uh, barriers that have been consolidated in many decades of study tradition. So we are talking about tradition. Osama Gad has recently pinpointed the customary Eurocentrism of papyrology, a situation that if one can, uh, if on one hand, may be explained with the overall historical tradition of classical studies, on the other hand, is absolutely paradoxical, since almost all the texts underlying papyrological studies come from Egypt. Gad has well highlighted the fact that papyrological Eurocentrism mainly stems from the print culture. As a result, most people in Egypt don't believe that papyri, I mean Greek papyri, are national history to them. Uh, the new digital possibilities of opening up data are thus a great opportunity for striving towards a breakthrough. And this is actually my words. I wouldn't exaggerate if I told you that was in a presentation in Leipzig. Uh, I would not exaggerate if I told you that I would feel myself guilty if someday one of the students grew up, I mean, Egyptian student, and imitate what IS uh, Daesh has have done to the archaeological site in Syria. And this connects me to Zena and her work about remembering the Romans in Syria. Because he does not appreciate it. Why he does not appreciate it? Simply because he does not understand what was there. What is this? And why again? Because most of the sources are not accessible. Either they are in reality on the ground there in Egypt or elsewhere in the Arab world, the Arab world secured in magazines that in the near future, due to many reasons that again also go beyond this presentation, won't open, ev uh, won't open even to scholars like you and me or it is presented online, virtually, with languages and actually concepts, which he does not understand, and filled up with pieces of information, data and metadata, metadata which are irrelevant to him. Um, this was the past, and to somewhat the present, but do you want that this would be our shared future? And I'm actually still asking this question. The proposal, this is Nicholas where the proposal is to exploit the interconnection power of the new technologies in terms of resource linking, metadata cataloging, translating, etc., to address new types of audience. Such a new perspective, this is important, such a new perspective would not harm what has been built so far, yet would substantially widen the scope of digital pedagogy and digital classics in promising development prospects. So I think this is very important, and uh, Nicola has heard my voice very well. And this is actually what I've been doing, and this is a concrete example of what I have been talking about. This is a new Fachvater book in Leipzig, which again, suffering from funding and a lot of things, but itself is away from this Eurocentrism. As you can see, it's updates uh, the technical uh, Wörterbuch or dictionary, German dictionary done by Leipziger in 1915, so more than 100 years ago. And it displayed the limata with spelling variants and translation into the languages German, French, English, Italian, Spanish, and Arabic. And I'm doing this Arabic. And actually, this, you know, uh, this uh, dictionary in itself, you know, is a very important bibliographic reference for any student in Egypt. Anyone who talks to me about it, I tell him, go to this, uh, I mean, why I want to do anything. I, I tell him, go to this uh, dictionary and look at it. The printed version of it is, in, is not accessible, but now it's accessible to many students, you know, in Germany, in France, in Italy, Spain, uh, Spain and even in the whole Arab world. And this is, for example, this is what Abruhia means, Ardu Sharaki. So when you tell the students that's Ardu Sharaki, it does not translate, you know, 
it's this is not this is just the label there is a whole history uh, behind al sharaki and he could do it you know he could search for al sharaki and my favorite example um yes uh sorry for this um yeah uh I will go now. Yes, and and my favorite example is Khersus, you know, the, the Ard al Khers. I have not uh, added the translation now, but the Khersus, al Ard al Khers, is a term which is known by any farmer in Egypt, you know, and this connects to me the land shaft in Hellenistan Egyptian of Schnabel, he who used Ard Sharaki and used the Ard Khersus in his uh, 1925 work about agriculture in Egypt. So. And this connects the students to what Ibn Mamati has been talking about in his Kitab Qawaneen uh, al-Dawaween. Uh, and Ibn Mamati was, you know, some, someone like the uh, finance minister under uh, uh, the Ayyubid, you know, um, um, uh, rule in the 20th century. And he died uh, at the beginning of the 13th century. And actually, his work is not is very valuable and uh, is important uh, in um, you know providing us information not only about the classifications of land, but as you can see, it has a detailed gazetteer describing the regions and habited places of Egypt, villages, estates, and camps, and. It has also the government department's rule of administration and details of administrative duties, uh, especially on matters concerning Iqtar, which is feudal system, which is Izba, which is Usiya in the Roman period, revenue, taxation, agricultural products, and so forth. It's a rich material, you know. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to jump a period, period now. The classification itself is you know arbitrary and we are speaking about the same space but again it's very important to understand this it has a survey of agricultural lands classifying them according to fertility hirsus land irrigation products seasons and so on and you have a description of agriculture year the calendar which is still in use now and was in the greek roman period you know and regulated by the coptic calendar because this man comes from a coptic family um what I want to say here is that the label is not the label, okay? It has a whole concept and a whole scholarship behind it. Um, and this will connect with what the, 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 the work that has been done by Gabriel and, and Valeria. Uh, they have uh, in their project, the cults project, you know, uh, they have uh, added a lot of labels, but these labels are not just labels. You know, when you decolonize the labels, you are not just replacing labels with another labels in Arabic and Othman. You are decolonizing the concepts themselves, the concepts, the content behind these labels. And you could go into the, the, uh, the, the website of the project and look at this. What is important to me is to decolonize not just the label, but also the concept, the content behind all this label, because the label is just, you know, the, 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 the covering, you know? So uh, to add Arabic and Turkish, to add more complexity, to add more content, to add more data, to add more metadata that help us to reconstruct the past. And here's, uh, I'm about to finish my, uh, my my presentation uh and i'm now uh you know quoting from my uh, forthcoming receptions of classical antiquity in egypt and arab world and this is abdurrahman badawi and it is um uh, very you know this is very informative informative about the idea of label and concept how to you know maybe you are using the same label in arabic or english but in the content, the, the data, the, the, the concepts behind this label is very colonial, even in Arabic itself. So what I have said is that knowledge and power are two ingredients that are hardly missed in the dramatically shifting and in many cases volatile political milieu of the Middle East and North Africa. A good example is the case of Abdurrahman Badawi, the classical philosopher, who fled from uh, Kamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt, you know, 
In September 1967, after the Nakba, after the defeat uh, from the Israeli forces, uh, to Libya, where he witnessed Muammar al-Qazafi coup d'etat in September 1969. So he was fleeing from a dictatorship, you know, to another dictatorship that is nascent dictatorship. And this will bring me to my last slide. Badawi, you know, uh, witnessed Muammar al-Qaddafi declaration on the 15th of April. He was fleeing the dictatorship. But actually, after just four years, in 1973, uh, al-Qaddafi uh, declared a cultural revolution, you know, <laughs> during a public speech in Zawara near Tunisia. So he, you know, just listen to the names and the connection between the Arabic Spring. Uh, and better we described the cultural revolution he witnessed as an attempt to get rid of all the imported theories that contradicted the September 11 revolution, which Imam al Qazafi has invented, along with the abolishing all laws and liberating the people while militarizing them at the same time. And anyone who has seen this picture of Imam al Qazafi in March 2011 uh, will understand what I mean by the use and misuse of labels like cultural revolution. Uh, he has used it extensively and anyone has used, most colonial states have been using it, you know. But again, it's uh, extremely uh, colonial in its content and has led to what we have seen uh, in the whole Middle East. Uh, thank you very much. And then now, now I will give um, um, the word to Valeria. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Usama. And because we are a little bit behind the schedule, I will just go straight to uh, introduce uh, our Patti. Uh, hello, Patti. Hello. Um, right. Um, can you actually see the presentation? Uh, we can switch straight to the presentation. Let me do that. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to this series of lectures. I think what you are doing here is quite exciting, so I'm very happy to be part of it. And many of the things that Sina and Osama just said, I think they resonate quite a lot, not only in terms of uh, my own research, but also in terms of my own kind of like pathway of reflection um, in the study of the cultures of my own country. Um, but particularly what I want to talk to, uh, to you about today is precisely our reflection about the use of spatial technologies, uh, particularly geographic information systems for history and archaeology. And I also want to talk about the implications of using this kind of digital technology, not only in terms of thinking about the space and place, but also in terms of the increasing um, um, adoption of digital technologies in these fields. And so just for those of you that uh, might never come across geographic information systems, so I'm just going to abbreviate that to GIS. Um, this is basically a software that allows you to create maps, but also to carry out uh, spatial analysis. And in fact, even if you uh, think that you are not that familiar with that technology, you have probably used it already. Um, if you have used any time Google Earth or Google Maps, you have in effect used a geographic information system already, although these forms of GIS with Google, um, they are light forms of GIS. So GIS was uh, very much created in the context of the environmental sciences and as a tool has been quite widely adopted now um, in archaeology since um, it was created at the end of the uh, 1970s. And it has been um, kind of like a slowly, slowly uh, been adopted also in history and literature. And now is quite um, permeating in a way or another many of the fields uh, within digital humanities. So just to give you an idea, the adoption of this technology has been so successful that uh, most of the degrees actually in archaeology and history are now incorporating some form of teaching in spatial analysis or at least of mapping. And I think you are actually going to have a session in your master's at least on mapping as well later on. And so um, in the past five years or so, um, we have uh, witnessed a new and kind of like fantastic way of exploration of geographic information um, as portrayed in corpora. I think um, in many ways, as it happens with all the adoption of uh, 
new technological developments. Let's say there is a period of romance, for instance, where the wow factor is quite strong. And so for quite a long period now, people have turned to geographic information systems as the main means, let's say, of uh, geographic exploration for spatial data in general. But to me, one of the limitations of geographic information systems or, or, or let's say the limitations of geographic information systems as such are also quite important to explore. So just to begin with, uh, GIS is capable, of course, of holding great amounts of geographic information. And that is great. That is actually one of the biggest strengths, let's say, and advantages. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we use it particularly quite a lot in archaeology and is increasingly being used in history as well. But as you are probably aware of, if you think about it, in history, um, but also in archaeology and in literature as well, we also deal with loads of spatial information that is not necessarily geographical. And I'm referring here to non-geographic representations of the space and place um, that can be, for instance, symbolic, uh, vague, or imaginary spaces that cannot be mapped. So just to give you an example of this, think, for instance, of um, the Mesoamerican underworld or the journey of a space uh, portrayed through a forest, let's say, uh, described by a prisoner esca escaping a, a camp during the Second World War. Or um, thinking of uh, more fun things, right, uh, Platform 9 three quarters in Harry Potter. Uh, which is located, for instance, in, in King's Cross in London, but in reality is kind of a liminal space between this and the magic uh, world. Now, the problem to me is not only that um, in humanities we deal with incomplete data and spaces and places that might not be geographically defined and therefore non-cartographic. I think the problem to me is also that uh, the technological solution that uh, geographic information systems offer is actually rooted in the Western paradigm of a space and place. Uh, this is to say in the cartographic representation of a space and um, Euclidean understanding of it. And of course, I mean, I'm not saying that this is not a valid use or a useful one, but um, as a person that has built a career basically from geographic information systems, I think that is also my obligation to reflect profoundly, uh, not only how we use these and other technologies, but also to carefully dissect, let's say, uh, the epistemologies behind and to explore uh, the possible ways in which we can accomplish, let's say, a holistic and integral analysis of a space and place in the humanities. And so, in doing so, what I also want to do is to consider also spatial knowledges, let's say, that have been in the awakening of spatial technologies traditionally uh, invisible. And the reason why I think this is really important has everything to do with my background. I'm Latin American, I'm Mexican, um, and today we are actually witnessing, uh, as Susana already uh, um, uh, raised, um, and uh, we are witnessing an unprecedented, uh, let's say, use in or uh, race as well in the adoption and the use of digital technologies and particularly geographic information systems in the global south. And we have to pay attention to this, not only because um, as the colonial studies have uh, increasingly pointed out, cartography can actually be a tool of uh, colonial e hegemony and power, but also because the global and modern dynamics that we encounter today kind of allow a silent reproduction of imaginaries uh, that as GIS basically are profoundly uh, rooted in the modern world system with all its occidentalism. And um, to me, this leaves little or almost no, no room um, uh, to a concept for what uh, Gloria uh, um, and Saldua call border thinking. And what I mean by border thinking is the experiences and production of knowledges that have been excluded by modernity and that respond as a struggle, let's say, against colonial uh, power. And I also agree or I also believe uh, quite as strongly as Brazilian anthropologist Darcy Rivero uh, says, it is kind of like time to uh, place at the forefront of our thinking as well the knowledge, uh, the knowledge systems that have been subalternized through the colonial force 
um, whether this is knowledge created outside of what in our legacy of the colonies um, and the Enlightenment, for instance, we perceive as unscientific and therefore often relegated to the humanistic um, or a, a, a completely different cultural imaginary. So the example that I that I want to give today, and I'm going to be, give just a short version of this example because I have worked quite a lot on it, but uh, today we just have uh, time to show a little bit of it. It's an example that comes uh, precisely from the 16th century, which in a way um, inaugurates the modern world system. And in that respect, a kind of like worldview that uh, permeates even today technological developments, including those from which GIS actually emerged. And it, um, it also opens, from my point of view, the dynamics through which subalternity at some point will come to exist in the modern world. So I think it's kind of like fit that we talk uh, through an example of the 16th century and of subaltern spatial thinking of this century to illustrate basically the point that I'm trying to uh, make. So. The example, as I was saying, emerged from this project um, uh, based here at Lancaster University called uh, Digging into Early Colonial Mexico. Um, this is a highly interdisciplinary project between computer scientists, historians, geographers, and archaeologists. And we are basically aiming to develop different uh, computational approaches to identify, extract, and cross-link information from a 16th century uh, corpus called the Geographic Reports of New Spain. Um, and we want to also, uh, as well, answer questions, historical questions, of course, from this, from this particular uh, uh, perspective and project. So just to give you a quick overview or background uh, behind this corpus, um, this is probably one of the most important historical collections of the um, early colonial history for the territory called the Vrisa Royalty of New Spain, which comprises now from North America on what is today uh, modern Mexico to Nicaragua in Central America. Now, um, this uh, a specific source, um, uh, the one that we are studying, I'm saying, um, refers particularly to the area of modern Mexico, and it compiles um, around 168 textual reports and 78 uh, maps. And all this information was collected through a questionnaire order by Philip uh, II, the Spanish king at the time, and its aim was basically to compile all sorts of important data across the all the visa royalties, and um, it gathers information on quite a large variety of topics. So these questionnaires were sent with, um, with a set of instructions on how to compile this information to all branches of government, including local corregidores, uh, sorry, which were um, the officials in charge of indigenous towns and also alcaldes, which um, at the time governed basically the Spanish towns. And this process included not only Spanish governmental officials, but also elders, indigenous informants, and um, indigenous nobility as well. And so these documents very much compile information about the geographies, the economy, environmental and social information, data about people, customs, religions, um, tradition, uh, native government, political organization, demography, um, even covers to the extent of some myths of origin, languages, cultures, and so on. So it's, 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 a, it's a huge um, wealth of information here. Now, accompanying this text, um, there is other fantastic set of information, and this is the one that I'm going to talk about here today. The, this, this is called the collection of the maps of the uh, Relaciones Geográficas, of the Geographic Reports of New Spain. And they are integral part of the corpus, but they were, in a way, they were never meant to be as they are today. And this is quite an interesting snippet of the history of uh, cartography. And what I mean by that is that at the time, uh, Lopez de Velasco, who was the chronicler cosmographer of the Indies and uh, the one that created the actual questionnaire, happened to be also a cartographer. And he asked um, in the questionnaire, particularly for the detailed measurements and observations, such as eclipses, for instance, as well as maps to be included um, along the questionnaire. And the reason why uh, he did so is because at the time the Spanish and the Portuguese were in this kind of like race to, well, it was not a kind, it was a race uh, to establish the cartographic measurement of longitude. Uh, so 
at the time, it was possible to establish latitude, but lo not longitude yet. And for that, uh, you needed basically measurements and astronomical observations from the new world. And this was of paramount importance because the one to solve this would be basically the first to establish precise territorial limits. And so Lopez de Velasco aims to gather this data from Spanish communities because he believes that they are the ones that are from, from the new visa royalties because um, uh, he thinks that they are the ones that uh, will have the skills to do so. And this information was not meant to be compiled, for instance, by indigenous communities. But um, in reality, um, neither the Spanish nor the native towns seem to pay too much attention to the instructions because most of them basically reply to all the questions, native and Spanish towns. So what Lopez de Velasco was very much expecting were measurements and maps um, as he knows them. Uh, this is to say in the European tradition, but instead what he uh, gets is uh, basically this. And these, as you can see, they are definitely not maps in the European tradition, although they are, um, some of them can be quite close. Um, and at the same time, they are not codices or Mesoamerican, Mesoamerican uh, scripts, basically, either, although many of them actually contain very strong Mesoamerican elements as well. So just to give you an indication of this, uh, this is the map of Sempuala. Um, um, this is one of the maps that accompanies the Relaciones Geográficas. And just to give you a quick um, example of how these traditions, let's say, come together during the 16th century, we can, we can see here, for instance, uh, the toponym um, in the Mesoamerican tradition as a logographic depiction. But you can also see here, for instance, the construction of an aqueduct. Um, and it's an aqueduct that is, is an archaeological site today. You can go and visit it. Um, it's actually, well, it's part of an archaeological site, but it is still in use. So this is a European style aqueduct. But what is very interesting about this as well is that um, it is connected, if you can see here, for instance, to uh, springs that are very much represented still in the uh, Mesoamerican style of representation. So these are certainly different representations combining particular spatial understandings of the world or imaginaries. And I think in the modern world, for instance, it's relatively easy to decodify, let's say, the ones that are closest to the cartographic representations as in the European tradition to us, because we speak the language of such tradition. But in reality, to know uh, uh, what is going on behind this map, we very much need to delve into the, into the Mesoamerican imaginary too, their spatial thinking. And um, I think only then we can start to understand how these eventually as well become subordinate to the European uh, representation of a space. So in order to do that, what I want to do is to have a quick look at the Mesoamerican codices, um, um, codices. So codices were uh, documents created before the contact with the Spanish. Uh, the majority of these were destroyed during the, post, during the process of colonization. Um, they basically uh, record a multiplicity of uh, histories, accounts, ambitions as well, and they also contain a wealth of spatial information. Um, but they cannot be truly understood, I will say, as maps in the Western tradition, but as what we call in Mesoamerican archaeology or anthropology, cosmovisions. This is to say, views of the world or the cosmos. Um, and this definition is close to what we previously referred to as the imaginary. So the example that I'm going to give here, uh, focus on a uh, codex uh, that is, uh, is called the Sush Nutal um, Codex. Ah, yes. Um, this is basically a, a mixed deck uh, codex that belongs to the region of uh, what is uh, Oaxaca today in Mexico. And we believe this um, codex was uh, made around the 14th century, and it is now located in the British Museum. And we can talk about, you know, that as well in, in the colonial perspective and so on. But um, it records um, particularly the history and the genealogy of uh, several generations um, that uh, live in the Poala Valley um, in Oaxaca. And it uh, focuses particularly in the genealogy and the history of one of the lords of this region, a deer, uh, called Adir Jawar Klo. 
And so for my purpose here, um, I want to focus in just in this particular, in two folios, in particular in folio uh, 37, which um, um, has what has been called an schematic map, let's say, of the Puala Valley. Now, each folio has a particular composition with interconnected elements that can read in a specific order. So I'm just going to start quickly with um, this particular element. So this is um, an open mouth uh, serpent, um, and it's basically a logographic symbol that means deep, uh, or that the name basically means um, uh, deep cave of the serpent. And this is a cave with a spring in the northeast edge of the actual valley. And these central symbols here uh, in kind of like a U-shape um, elements are toponyms for these two rivers. The first one, which um, is a hank um, of knotted grass, means basically river of the canyon of the soap plant. And the hand, the second one, the hand uh, grabbing a bunch of feathers means the river of the lineages. And uh, these two rivers actually run across the valley. Now, the, this lower half kind of like human figure on the right, uh, we believe that it represents a logographic rendering of the name Cliff of the Childbirth. Um, and this precipice is actually known today. I'll show you in a second. And so notice also, please, these two other features. Um, this uh, tree of the birth, which is called, and this waterfall as well. Now, these geographic features can be perfectly identified in geographic information systems such as Google Earth or ArcMap or you name it, uh, Google Maps as well, if you want. And we can actually identify uh, the two rivers, for instance, we identify these um, uh, these are the lines that um, are full of trees. They, they are the two rivers within this valley. Um, we can identify as well the cliff and the waterfall within the cliff. Um, and, but also, we could also identify, for instance, the tree. We know this because the community actually still gathers there and they hold the elders council under this tree. And um, all important decisions are actually made there. And uh, we believe that this is um, a century old, uh, well, centuries old tradition. Um, and this is quite interesting. And so these are just quickly uh, pictures of these actual places. So this is um, this is the Acantilado del Nacimiento. This is the actual cave. And this is just a, a quick view of how this uh, particular landscape of the valley looks like. And so as we just as I just show you through uh, Google Maps or well, Google Earth in this case, uh, we have very important geographic elements in these historical documents. But although we could map them with, with, with Google Earth, um, they cannot be seen from um, a Cartesian perspective. Um, just to begin with, as I just did now, uh, showing you these Google Earth pictures, and this is normally the approach that we have in archaeology and history, when we work with cartography and the modern Western view, we tend to take first a visual approach to the landscape, taking a kind of like bird's eye view of the world, right? This basically means to take distance from nature and men, but um, in the Mesoamerican view, the world doesn't work um, in this way at all. And the components, for instance, of these bodies um, are, are, are not elements on their own. They are a composition of a full cosmovision. So these geographic depictions are basically charged with very important symbolic meaning that is intertwined with historical events, uh, social interaction, social interactions, and of course, um, the, the cosmogony as well. So take just the depiction of the tree, for instance. In the Mesoamerican tradition, trees are um, the kind of like three-dimensional thread that link, links and sustains all life in the cosmos, uh, going through the celestial, the terrestrial, and the infra-world levels of uh, the cosmos. And so in the case of this tree um, of the Apoala Valley, this is not only uh, a spatial reference, let's say, in the landscape, but it's also a very important symbolic figure char charged with a lot of meaning. And um, this is so much so, of course, that even after 700 years, right, there is still the memory of this tree in this community and it's still um, actually used. And I 
think as well that this cannot be seen in disconnection with the rest of the elements of this folio. So um, the elements on the on the on the top of the river also indicate that these geographers, these geographer, these geographies are basically uh, uh, deeply connected with historical genealogy. Now. If we want to interpret this, uh, the flow of information in the codices, for instance, is usually given by pathways um, or divisions to kind of like indicate the direction of reading. But OK, I'm not going to go into that now. So what we have um, here at the moment um, are uh, Lord One Flower and Lady Thirteen Flower sit on the top of the river of the canyon. Um, they are the parents of Lady Nine Alligator and her husband, Lord Nine Wind Quetzalcoatl, who sits in the, um, notice the name, River of the Lineages. Um, so they are the founders of the Apoala Valley, um, and therefore they are on top of the rivers identifying these as very important uh, parts not only of the landscape but also of the lineages. And so the flow follows the body of the serpent that you um, see um, around. Let me just point out that. Um, and this leads to the cliff of the childbirth and then another section of the genealogy um, and history which is basically given by the two pairs of brothers on the top. Um, and they are entering then the cave um, of the mouth of the serpent. Now, in the next folio, basically, what you can see, uh, they are entering. They are entering here, um, the the cave of the serpent, and they are continuing their pathway into this next folio, right? And so this leads them into a next episode where they basically uh, descend into the dominion of the god of the rain, um, that eventually continue their pathway, which lead them into a ceremony um, and historical account basically continues to be narrated in this page and then in the next one and so on. So what I wanted to do with this example is just to show you a different conception of spatial thinking where spatiality, let's say, in all senses, whether symbolic or geographic, are basically profoundly intertwined with sociocultural components that are actually essential not only to understand uh, the formation of this kingdom, but also its place in the world in general. This is to say, it's imaginary and um, it's cosmogony. So to finish the case study, I just want to fast forward in time and to show you then now the 16th century map of Teosacalco. So this map was created for the Relaciones Geográficas, for the geographic reports of New Spain around 60 years after the fall of the Aztec Empire in 1521. And it basically corresponds also to the mystic region of Oaxaca, precisely to the place that I just show you in the codex. And this map is, um, in fact, portraying a massive region uh, covering a huge area. Um, and so this is a colonial map. Uh, but as in the tradition of the codices, uh, we actually see the lineage of the Osacalco order in the left hand side uh, by generation. So we have in the lower left corner, the toponym of Pilantongo, the town from which actually the different uh, lineages emerge. And the codex portrayed the different dynasties from the uh, 11th century to the ruler at the time that the map was actually created. This is to say uh, 1580. And um, Barbara Mundi, who has studied this very, very much, um, notices how the scale of the map judging according to her by the placement of the towns in relation to where Teosacalco is. So, sorry, let me just point out um, uh, Teosacalco. Um, so she she basically thinks that um, the, the scale of the map decreases, let's say, um, as one moves away from it. And her intention with this idea is not to make a comparison uh, with planimetric maps and the Euclidean conception of a space, but basically to show that this map uses what she calls a communicentric projection. This is to say a projection that is centered at the heart of the community. And so following this idea, um, I think that if we are to understand any form of a spatial thinking, we need to decodify its projection, right? Whether we aim to explore a literary genre or a novel or historical periods or events, we basically need to understand the imaginary, the projection in which they operate. 
And so this implies many times uh, a departure from the cartographic sense or base through which, through which we usually understand uh, the world, at least from the Western perspective. Right, so um, just to conclude, um, we know that the role of cartography and uh, the forceful imposition of Western concessions of a space and place in colonial times and kind of like the perpetuation of this over time have been heavily discussed actually in post-colonial and, and the colonial thinking, but um, funnily enough, somehow this has barely translated to the realm of geographic information systems, uh, despite being the technical extension of Western spatial conceptions and the world um, spatial mm -hmm. tool uh, for excellence. So colonization, um, as Walter Mignolo says, uh, continues to be in this global domain and on name on spoken driving force of a modernization at the market. And I think this permeates in a silent way, um, well, as, 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 um, as the other two speakers also clearly demonstrate, how we do academic work, uh, but also how we approach technology. And this happens indeed in the case of uh, digital humanities, for instance. And so this is not to say that there haven't been, of course, important debates or attempts from within to address actually this issue. So um, there, is a, there was a current, for instance, in the 1990s called Critical GIS, uh, which was a movement by social and human geographers. And they actually aim to address this precise problem. Um, and they tried to create a kind of like sensitivity to the colonial difference by thinking about the other. But from my point of view, their triumph was also kind of like their failure. Um, kind of like in thinking of the other, researchers introduced, for instance, in that particular movement, uh, Native Americans to the world of geographic information systems, uh, but mainly as users of the tool. So they teach, uh, they taught uh, Native American uh, students basically to use geographic information systems. So. Despite GIS was introduced to their world, the Native American imaginary was not introduced to geographic information systems. Um, so what, what we are trying to claim here now um, is kind of different. So I'm not saying that we need to abandon research with GIS at all in history and archaeology. I think that uh, computational tools like GIS can be entirely adequate to study some historical, archaeological, and literary phenomena, for instance and uh, can be of great use as well to understand information at a large scale. But I will also say that is neither the best nor the only way to produce spatial knowledge. And in this sense, um, the same as Mignolo says, for instance, social historical transformations also demand disciplinary modifications too. And in a way, um, we can um, say that the problem is not the software, right? Because GIS was never conceived for some of the tasks and, and issues that uh, humanists are actually trying to tackle with it. And one could simply advise not to use them in specific cases, right? But I think that the problem still lies very much in the perpetuation of um, dominant worldviews and with increasing emergence of different spatial perspectives, including those uh, non-Western and led by the global South, um, and, you know, in fields like digital humanities, I truly believe that it's essential to revisit and declare the diversity of needs in spatial studies um, within the humanities. So just to finish now, um, borrowing Walter's Mignolo words in local histories and global designs, my goal here is not um, only the colonization, but transformation of um, the rigid epistemic and territorial frontiers established and controlled by the coloniality of power in the process of building the modern world system. And so the idea here is to repurpose, from my perspective that I work basically in technologies, to repurpose for computational approaches what uh, Foucault uh, called already 42 years ago, the insurrection of the subjugated knowledges and so basically to address the subalternization of knowledge um, in the creation of technologies, whether that refers actually to the colonial imaginary over the native in the historical context or the scientific over the humanistic, for instance. Sorry, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Patty, and to all uh, 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 our 
our speakers that was uh, really interesting and uh, I think that you know the students are going to find that um, you know quite a, quite an engaging um, debate. Um, we we are uh, a little bit late, but I think uh, I hope that I can abuse the patience of the speakers um, if there are um, if there are questions either from the people that are uh, following us. Uh, I saw also. Uh, Tom among the students, Tom Elliott, uh, before saying hi, or if um, any of you want to um, um, ask, uh, any of you speakers want to ask something uh, to one of the other speakers, uh, I think that we have, we may have time for, you know, a couple of quick questions. Remember to unmute yourselves if you want to if you want to ask uh, something. Uh, maybe um, I can also if if we don't have any burning question, I can uh, use maybe this couple of minutes also to tell the students that this week we don't have a practical uh, exercise. Um, but what I would like, uh, what I would invite you to do is to have a look at our readings, the further readings, and also the uh, other resources uh, list that you will find on the GitHub page. Also think of the um, examples that Patty and Sama and Zina had mentioned. And um, also feel free to look uh, for more online. You can Google keywords like, you know, um, colonized culture heritage, imperialism in culture heritage, repatriation, and things like that, and choose one case study, choose, uh, you know, one object, choose one issue that you want to uh, know more about and you want to talk uh, to the rest of the class about. Um, I will also invite you to Google a couple of concepts that have been mentioned but not explained. And uh, I don't think we have time to go through that, but maybe look what uh, our speakers um, meant by Global South and Global North, if you're not familiar with that. And um, maybe also uh, Google what um, a white savior complex or a white savior uh, behavior uh, means in this, uh, in this context. So um, do you guys have any questions for each other? Um, I don't have a question, but I will just say that um, I'm here in London and um, if anyone wants to anything about what I have said, I, I hope you have understand what I, you know, or I have, you know, um, made it clear what I meant but about the concepts that I mean. So I'm here and uh, feel free to come to me and tell me whatever you want. Um, but I'm really, I have really enjoyed Zena's and uh, Patty's uh, talks, and I have a lot of questions, but I think I will do it privately, not in the session. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. And Usama, for the students in London in the ICS, Usama will be joining us um, on Thursday, so you can ask him um, everything uh, about uh, the troubled uh, archive. Um, Okay, I don't see questions from the audience either. Uh, I think we have really, really, um, you know, run out of time. So thank you uh, again for uh, for a great uh, seminar, and see you next week with our seminar on. Uh, I know this. I know this on 3D modeling. Okay, I'm also speaking on that. So see you next week uh, for 3D modeling for culture heritage. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Valeria. Bye. Thank you, Valeria.